Well, I should like to say this briefly, brethren and sisters, before giving the time over to Brother Skousen. It is with a very keen sense of uh, the fact that the youth of our church must very soon accept the responsibilities of leadership in the church that we, who are older, are anxious to bring them close to us and we be close to them so that we may help them to be prepared for the time when their responsibilities will be placed upon them. Now to young men and young women that idea may not mean very much, but the older one gets the more impressed he is by the speed with which time passes and responsibility shifts to new and younger hands. We, the parents, people in responsibility now in this stake, in the bishoprics, throughout the organizations of the stake, are deeply aware of the fact that sometime soon our youth must take over in our stead. We want you to take over with a great deal of joy and strength and the power particularly of righteousness that you may have a complete assurance of an alliance with the Lord. And that's why we're so anxious that you continue steadfast and faithful and active in the organizations of the church and in the priesthood as you have such an abundant opportunity to do. For that reason, we invite men of the wisdom and of the experience of Brother Skousen to come and to share with you their knowledge, their wisdom, their insight, their testimony, and particularly their love of the Lord. And in all of these particulars, Brother Skousen qualifies eminently. It'll be a pleasure now, Brother Skousen, for you to take the time you desire to address this audience of our youth of Sugar House Steak. Thank you. I certainly count it an honor to have the pleasure of spending these last um, closing portions of this Sabbath night with this fine assembly of mothers and fathers and young people. We're really living in an exciting period of the Earth's history where things are moving so fast that mankind is getting ready to launch forth from this little planet and explore out in space. We're being told that it will not be long before one of our race will actually stand on the moon and uh, then return and tell us all about it. There are many voices abroad in the earth speaking to our young people saying this is good and this is better. And our Heavenly Father intended that our young people would have the very best, the things that lead to happy living. And that's the task of these bishops and stake presidents, these high councilmen and these teachers to give our young people the very best. But in all cases, our young folks have to test what they get, and they are going to find that some of the voices abroad in the earth are telling them things that are supposed to be good, which life itself will teach them are not as sweet as their salesmen would have us believe. I'm reminded of an experience I had as a young boy up in Canada. In Canada, the winters used to be particularly severe, much more so than now. And uh, as a result, just as soon as spring would come and the sunshine would begin to filter through, our parents would push us outside early in the day and make us stay outside as much as possible uh, so that we could get a lot of vitamin D. We were allowed to come back into the house for a little refreshment, maybe around 10 o'clock in the morning, and then, of course, at lunch and once again in the afternoon. But that was about all. And I remember on one occasion coming in about 10 o'clock in the morning, all hot and sweaty, and looking for the peanut butter and jelly sandwich and the glass of buttermilk Mother usually prepared. And I couldn't find Mother, and I couldn't find the food, which was uh, equally bad. In fact, the house was quiet and silent. The blinds were pulled, there was an occasional fly buzzing about, but I just uh, felt like I'd been abandoned. 
And uh, so I wandered around and finally I did discover on the sideboard a glass of nice cold water that apparently mom had brought in from outside and uh, the crystals were still clinging to the outside of the glass so I decided that's all she had time to prepare so I drank it to the bottom and it was delicious I loved it it was really a great drink and so I went over to my corner of this big rambling house to lie down rest a few minutes and I had just about arrived at my room when I thought I heard what sounded like an Indian yell coming from the kitchen. And on second thought, it sounded like my younger brother. And you would have thought he was being scalped. In any event, something terrible had happened in his life. And so from almost everywhere in this big quiet house, people suddenly appeared. And they all started charging for the kitchen to see what in the world had happened to my young brother. And I went in too and we came in from all doors and we found him sitting in the middle of the floor, holding up the glass I had just emptied. He looked around accusingly and said, what happened to my frog's eggs? You know that experience um, almost broke me of drinking? <laughs> At least I, I never take a drink anymore without looking through the glass. <laughs> and I learned from that experience what all young people learn, that many of the things which seem delicious and delightful on first exposure have a different reaction when you find out what it really was. Well, we're very proud of our young people and we're anxious that the things that we tell them shall be true and reliable and that life itself will verify that these things that we do give them are good and are true and not the kind of things that will have a reaction later on. Last week I had the pleasure of addressing the International Association of Chiefs of Police at the Statler Hotel in New York City. And afterwards, Dave Garraway asked me to come over to the NBC studios to be interviewed on his television program. And I noticed that the most newsworthy thing he wanted to discuss about Utah were our boys and girls. And I was happy to be able to report that while we have our share of uh, mischief among our young folks, uh, our juvenile delinquency and certainly our crimes of violence are far below the national average. And the wonderful program that is being carried out among the young people bears good fruits, as it should do. I remember when Look Magazine sent its reporter out to Utah about a year ago to find out uh, what the program of the church was the reporter spent most of his time concentrating on the young people and was very impressed with the things that he saw. Uh, he was impressed with the missionary program. And this morning as I addressed a group of about 250 missionaries between 7 and 9 a.m., I was impressed with them. Clean, sharp appearing, nearly all of them at least partially college educated, uh, all in age as a group between 20 and 22 years. A week from today, they'll be in the four corners of the world, paying their own way as they endeavor to spread truth and light and hope in the hearts of mankind. Well, this impressed uh, the writer for Look magazine, and so he went to see the mission home, to watch the missionaries be set apart, and to interview the missionaries. This man's name was Hartzell Spence, and I'm sure many of you saw his report. He said, um, Mormonism is unique among religions in that every two weeks some 70 to 90 young men and women, the boys 22, uh, 20 years old, the girls 23, leave for two years of missionary work. Their modest expenses averaging $60 a month are paid by themselves or their parents. What impels them to go? I watched the ceremony that set apart 69 young people for this task. 
then picked one of them at random for questioning. He was Bruce Ballard, a handsome, stocky lad from California. He had played football at UCLA, including the Rose Bowl game of 1956, and had graduated with a Phi Beta Kappa key. After five months at medical college, he was called by the church leaders to be a missionary. How did he like that, I asked. He said, I was honored and humbled. I am thrilled that this is the work of God, and this is the work he wants me to do. Mormons are the happiest people in the world, and I want to help others find this happiness. And then uh, the reporter concluded, his glowing fiance who sat beside him nodded in proud agreement. She will wait for him. Another thing that the reporter <laughs> indicated um, a amazement at was the amount of time that the, the adults in the church spend in trying to help the young people develop their talents and become their very best mature selves. He went to the presiding bishop's office and to the Mutual Improvement Association and the Sunday School and gathered a tremendous number of statistics. And he found that there were 550 major dance festivals held in the church during the previous year, and over 15,000 individual dances. He found that there were 9,728 drama productions, with over 66,000 young actors participating. You see, Hollywood will always have a source of talent to draw on. He found that 43,846 young people had participated in debates and orations, that 61,149 young people had participated in choirs as singers. He found that over 4,000 ball teams had been organized by the church and over 67,000 players had participated. And he said, no wonder these young people have a, an opportunity to grow up fast, acquire a sense of responsibility, and become outstanding citizens. Well, that only happens if our young people take advantage of the program. But if they do take advantage of it, it makes ordinary boys and girls extraordinary men and women. And the sociologists who have studied it have been impressed by that. It doesn't make us better than other people, per se. It doesn't give any Latter-day Saint boy and girl a, a, a um, place to boast and say, I am better than other people. But it does give him the prerogative of saying, I'm a lot better person having followed the program of the church than I would have otherwise been. And so it builds ordinary boys and girls into extraordinary men and women. And among us there are some who are brilliant, and it particularly makes shining stars of them. I'm impressed with the fact that when we welcome a little boy or girl into our home as a baby, it has special significance in the Mormon church. This little personality is welcomed, first of all, and it's a great privilege to be welcomed in a home. Because in police work we find that tens of thousands of boys and girls were not welcomed into their homes. And at age four and five, an exasperated mother and father will, will tell them as such. We didn't want you in the first place and behavior, we'll get rid of you, they're told. And a parent who tells that to a child doesn't know that sometimes they're laying the foundation for a psychopathic criminal. For a child seldom is able to get over the scars of being rejected. And sometimes they grow up fighting all adults because their own mother and father, the ones they loved the most, said they didn't really want them. And so it's a wonderful thing to be born in a home wanted expected, anticipated, and welcomed. And to be able to be taken in the arms of one's father, as happened to me and I'm sure to probably most of you, to be presented to the congregation 
and then given a name and a blessing through the power of the priesthood by your own father who holds that priesthood. And then to go along through primary and Sunday school until you reach the age of eight and then have the bishop take you aside and say, now, uh, you've been on probation for eight years and we're ready to have you baptized a full-fledged member of the church. Do you think you can stand it? Oh, yeah, sure, I can stand it. I'd like to do it. Well, now, he says, this means that you can't tell fibs. Oh, it does? Yes. Uh, this means you can't uh, snitch at Woolworths. Oh, it does? Yes. Uh, this means you are to be obedient to your mother and father and be a real fine person. Now, that's what you promise to do when you're baptized. Do you think you could uh, take on those kind of responsibilities? And each of us had that opportunity as children growing up in the church to respond. And I've never known a child who was properly approached to decline these opportunities, although sometimes he's a little bit surprised to find that there's something that goes with baptism. And then we go along for about four more years, and they're pretty exciting years because between 8 and 12, a boy goes through a very interesting transition. Now, I'm talking mostly about boys here at the moment because I've just finished this series of articles on boys. Uh, the girls get their attention, too, in due time. But let me just comment about a boy. He goes through quite a transition. Uh, he goes from 8 to 9 uh, quite easily, gets along pretty well, does fairly well in school. But age 9 is a teasing year. He gets into a, a little difficulty during 9 and 10. He has a tendency to get with the gang and... Uh, He's never home for supper. It's hard to keep track of him. And uh, when it comes to teasing younger brothers and sisters, he's a champ. But then he's reminded every once in a while what he promised to do at baptism, so he, he tries to do better. And he slips over into age 10 to 11 beautifully. This is the golden year of a boy, the last good year he'll have. <laughs> and it's this year that he does particularly well in school. And uh, somehow he just seems to fit in. Everybody likes him, he likes everybody, and he gets along, as a rule, very nicely. And then at about a quarter after 11, <laughs> something happens to a boy and he turns daydreamer. And he goes into reverse. And his parents wonder, what in the world has happened to Junior? He used to be so polite and considered, he could get himself clean in the shower, he would make his bed, he was doing so well in school, but suddenly he has uh, lost all of this aptitude. He gets in the shower, he's in there 30 minutes. Suddenly all the hot water's gone, and you hear him in there bellowing like a bull. <laughs> what happened to the hot water? And so you say to him, well, you've run it all out. Are you clean? Why, he says, no, I haven't even started yet. <laughs> you say, you mean you haven't used the soap? Well, he says, no. So we have this problem of uh, getting him out and, uh, and getting some warm water and helping him, just like he, when he was a little boy. And we say, son, what in the world's happened to you? And he says, nothing. <laughs> but you notice as he goes around, he, he sort of has his mind in the clouds, can't remember his lunch, or his overshoes, or his coat, or his books. He goes to school and the teacher says, Where your, where's your homework? And he says, homework? <laughs> he wears his shoes untied, he can't get his coat uh, buttoned properly, the wrong button is always in the wrong buttonhole, he can't get his shirt on right. And you wonder, what in the world has happened to this boy? As a matter of fact, he sort of resists authority between 11 and 12 frequently. And I know with our oldest boy, we went to see a psychiatrist. <laughs> Not to help the boy, but to help the parents. <laughs> and the good doctor told us not to worry too much that this would last, oh, anywhere from 10 to 14 months. And uh, then after he had proven to himself that 
He didn't have to do things just because we said he should do it, but really because he wanted to do it, then he would taper off and be his better self again. So age 12 is actually a return to normalcy. And that's a good time to come up to him and say, now son, would you like to have the responsibilities of priesthood service? This is a really fine time to have this happen to a boy. And so he is ordained to the Aaronic priesthood, and he's the keeper at the gate of the chapel. And he uh, helps the bishop serve the widows and the orphans and the people in need. And he goes around and collects fast offerings, and he serves the sacrament and the communion. And if he does a real good job at the age of 14, he is allowed to become a teacher. Can you imagine that? A teacher at 14? And I remember when I was ordained a teacher down in old Mexico, I had enjoyed being a deacon. I was a little worried about being a teacher. And one night our stake patriarch came to take me ward teaching. And we went out of the house and then we got out underneath one of the big poplar trees and we knelt down on a ditch bank and had prayer together. I never forgot that. And then he, we went into the various homes, and he did the teaching this first time. But I remember that at the third home, there was a mother and father that was having difficulty. They'd been quarreling about one thing and another. And so this stake patriarch invited them to pour out their hearts to him to see if he could counsel them in any way. And they did. And there I sat, listening. A 14-year-old in on some real good gossip. <clears throat> and I noticed that when the talks were over, the patriarch said to the father of that family, you know, I have a suggestion for you, brother so-and-so. You're letting your wife raise your family. She's the one that takes them to church, that sees that they go to scout meeting and primary She's the one that encourages them in school. And I know you're busy trying to make a living and it isn't easy these days, but this household needs a leader. You've let your wife down. Now that's the only reason you have quarreling in this home. And you can mend this fault. And as I sat there listening to him, I saw a spirit come over this mother and father that ultimately worked out within a year very nicely. And as we went out of that home that night, Patriarch Walzer took me by the arm and said, Now, you've seen something tonight that you must seal up in your heart. I will report it to the bishop. No one else must know about it. And thus I learned to be a teacher in the church at 14. And at age 16, the privilege of actually participating in the spiritual ordinances of the church. At age 16, one is ordained a priest in the Aaronic priesthood. In the ancient days, this was not permitted until one had grown up and become rather elderly and had proven himself. But under the accelerated church program of today, you can be a priest in your youth if you can prove yourself worthy. At the age of 17, after being a priest only one year, by special dispensation of President Grant, our bishop ordained me an elder and I was called to go on a mission to the British Isles. Today we very seldom ordain a person to be an elder until he is at least 20. And that's great wisdom. I did have good counsel and good guidance in my youth and appreciated the privilege of being ordained an elder at 17 and going on a mission. But as a general principle, the, there are great responsibilities associated with the Melchizedek priesthood, and it is best to wait until one has passed the rather rebellious years of 17, 18, and 19. So at 17, I found myself on the way to England, and it was exciting. They told me that being so young, I probably wouldn't ever even get to be a senior companion. That's what my friends told me. But I'd received my call, and I was going to go, and uh, so if I weren't going to become a senior companion or anything, I'd just fulfill my mission the best I could. I got over to England, and everything was strange. 
Even the people's talk seemed strange, and I couldn't understand a lot of it. And the money was all different. When I got on the train and the man come along and said he wanted a couple of bob and tuppence evening, I just <laughs> reached into my pocket and held out a handful of money and hoped he was honest. <laughs> I got over to the mission home there in London and uh, was sitting around watching the others who seemed to know their way around a little better than I did. And a, a missionary walked up to me and said, I'm Elder Doan from Mesa, Arizona. Uh, you're Elder Scousen. And I said, yes, that's right. Well, now he said, are you f from the Scousens in southern Arizona? And I said, yes, only I'm the California branch. Well, now he said, I need a companion to go down to speak at Hyde Park. Will you go with me? I said, well, uh, would I have to speak? Oh, no, I only need a companion, he said. And I said, I would love to go. <laughs> so Elder Doan went over to a closet and he got out a little bundle. It looked like a lot of long sticks wrapped in a canvas. And it had a little handle. And down into the subway we went. And pretty soon we came up at what he told me was Hyde Park. And here were thousands of people all milling around and there were people talking about politics and people talking about religion and people talking about medicines and everything under the sun. And Elder Doan went right into the middle of these tremendous crowds and he seemed to be looking for a little brass number on the concrete. And he would say, pardon me, please, pardon me, pardon me. And finally he found the little brass plate that bore the number where he was authorized to speak. Well, everybody was listening to someone else. And I thought, this is a strange situation. This isn't a place to hold a religious meeting. But he has started to unfold this canvas and these sticks, and he put them together like tinker toys. And when he got through, he had to stand. And he put the canvas over the front, and it said, Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, Mormons. And the next thing I knew... Elder Doan had taken a songbook out of his briefcase and being about six foot four, 220 pounds, he climbed up on that little flimsy stand and all by himself sang, How Firm a Foundation. <laughs> the next thing I noticed, all of these people turned toward him as though they had been waiting for his meeting to start, as I later found out to be the case. And here were literally hundreds of people, as far out as his voice could be heard, listening to a sermon that he subsequently gave that lasted 40 minutes. And I noticed how it just poured out of him, no notes, he knew his information, and the people were interested in it. And when he had finished, he bore his testimony. But he didn't step off the stand. He stood there as though he were waiting for questions, and they began to come. And the first question um, was interesting. There was a little fellow there in a cutaway coat and striped trousers that I later learned was a graduate of Oxford. And this was the kind of question that he posed to Elder Doan. He said, Elder, I have been listening to the Mormon elders nigh on to 20 years. But I've always been impressed with the fact that they all come from within the great walled city of Salt Lake. What I would like to do is to hear a Mormon who doesn't come from the great walled city of Salt Lake. And I thought to myself, Elder Don will really be able to help him out. And he'll tell him that he comes from Arizona and that will be fine. Elder Don looked at this questioner for a moment and said, would you really like to hear from somebody who doesn't come from the great walled city of Salt Lake? And the whole crowd responded, hear, hear. And I thought this was a good way for Elder Doan to work into this situation. The next thing I heard him say was, well, tonight I have with me a young man who does not come from the great walled city of Salt Lake, but from California. Now, I promised him, because he's only been here on British soil for five hours, 
that I would not call upon him to speak. But since you have called upon him to speak, <laughs> I introduce you to Elder Skousen. Now, I want to tell you, talk about a sudden blackout. <laughs> Mentally and physically and spiritually. And I suddenly said to myself, my goodness, what did my Sunday school teacher say? Now, let's see, and was there something at Mutual maybe I could pass along? <laughs> And you know, as I got up on that little stand, it wasn't a firm foundation at all. <laughs> and it practically shook apart. But a quieting spirit seemed to come over me which said, tell them why you're here. Tell them about the restoration. Tell them the great thing that's happened in the earth. And so I took about ten minutes to tell them. And when I had finished, I bore my testimony and I started to quickly get down. But this little fellow was too fast for me in the front row. And he said, one moment, Elder. He said, I would very much like to have you um, give us the Mormon interpretation of two passages of Scripture. Would you please compare Second Kings 7 and 5 with Acts 13 and 3? <laughs> Second Kings. <laughs> Might be in the Book of Mormon. <laughs> I had never read Second Kings in my life. I had read Acts sometime. But we had been trained in the mission home not to bluff, and so I gave him the answer that we were told to give. I said, well now, I don't know where I will be a week from now, but if I am in London, and if I am invited to attend this meeting again, I will look up the answer, and that will be the first question we will handle next week. Thank you. <laughs> and I got right down. <laughs> well, one week from then, I was not in London. I was in the Midlands, in Sheffield. But I want to tell you that during that week I had found the second book of Kings in the Old Testament and read it like I never read a book in my life. And I had read the book of Acts and I had found the answer to his particular question. And you know I was never asked that question again during my whole mission experience. <laughs> but I was asked thousands of other questions. And so I kept going, reading this book and that book, trying to get, keep up with the questions and getting the proper answers. And what a stimulating experience. So that by the time this two years was up, all kinds of wonderful things had happened. Not only had I served as a senior companion, but as the president of a branch and uh, had read all of the four standards of uh, church works uh, and had... Uh, had the kind of stimulation that comes from wanting to know yourself what the answers are. The last portion of my mission was spent in Ireland presiding over the northern part of Ireland as district president. And it demonstrated something to me that I've never forgotten, that age doesn't really count in the church. Neither youth nor elderliness, but only the spirit and the anxiety to serve. And I remember after leaving Ireland and having those wonderful people tell me goodbye, I came back to America regretful that my missionary experience had terminated so soon. I was then 19. I felt much more mature and experienced than one would ordinarily at 19. And I've been everlastingly grateful to this church for that wonderful experience to help me get started properly early in youth so that um, one's later life might be more profitable. After coming back and starting in college, uh, I had the privilege of serving as student body president of one of the colleges in California. And, the, and one of the senators from California selected the student body presidents from several of the colleges and offered them 
jobs in Washington to do graduate work. And that's how I happened to go to Washington and uh, study law. I had only been there a short time before I realized that um, there was a particular group of people in Washington that were doing something very exciting. The FBI. My roommate was working for the FBI as a messenger. And he used to work so hard that he'd come home at night, blisters on his feet. He would be haggard and tired. He would collapse on the bed, not even be able to eat supper with us. He'd be so tired. And as soon as he'd refreshed himself a little bit, he'd say, Boy, I like my job. And I thought, you really must like it. And I was enjoying my work as a legal auditor, but not that much. And so I asked him a lot about the FBI, and, and though I knew I would have to take about a thousand dollar cut in salary to get started, because everybody in the FBI then was entering as a messenger, uh, unless you entered as a a full-fledged lawyer or accountant, which I was not able to do at that time, I nevertheless decided I would try to get into the FBI. And you see, it was during the Depression, they were only appointing about one out of several hundred who would apply for jobs. And so I knew that my chances really weren't very good. But finally, I did get a call to come down for an interview. And my roommate said, now this is very important. Don't muff this. Be sure and wear the, your, your Sunday suit and, and dress conservatively. Don't wear that green tie with orange airplanes on it. <laughs> and he said another thing, when they ask you questions, be sure and answer very carefully because they check on everything. You want to be sure that you say it just right. And so I went down. The man that interviewed me was one of the most unusual people I have ever talked to. He was nice enough but very formal. And he had in front of him a large yellow pad of paper. And he had the rather uh, unusual habit of asking you questions and then writing down your answers without looking at the paper. He would just look right straight at you and write the answers <laughs> down. <laughs> now there was only one thing that worried me about this interview. And that was the fact that I didn't uh, know how he would interpret two years of missionary experience. I had been told that he would start right out uh, with my birth up in Canada and, and follow me down through my uh, schooling in old Mexico and my graduation from high school in San Bernardino, California. And, and then he would ask me about uh, my experience over in England and and you know, some people have an odd idea about missionaries. They think of missionaries as people that run away to the dark jungles of Africa somewhere and sit on the bank of a stream and talk to the natives. Um, and they sort of, uh, they have a funny feeling about this business of missionary service, so I didn't know how they'd interpret it. And so I had decided that I wouldn't use the word missionary that when he asked me about my service in England, I would just describe what we did so he wouldn't get any wrong ideas. So sure enough, he got up to 1930, and he said, uh, says here, uh, two years of church service. Yes, sir. Uh, what did you do? Well, uh, we made lots of public contacts, and... Uh, uh, we gave lots of talks. We had to handle the finances for the church. We had a, a lot of opportunity to learn business procedures. And he stopped me and he said, you mean you were just doing regular missionary work? Yes, sir. <laughs> then he started asking some very personal questions. He said, by the way, do you smoke? I thought that was kind of a funny question to ask a person. But I answered him. I said, uh, no, sir. Did you ever smoke? <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> when? 
when I was about 11. <laughs> well, he said, what happened? I said, well, my father caught me. <laughs> he really did, too. <laughs> Smoking newspaper and cedar bark behind the pig pen. <laughs> well, he said, what I wanted to know is whether or not you have smoked any appreciable length of time. No, sir. You drink? And I could tell by the tone of his voice he didn't mean buttermilk. <laughs> and I said, no, sir. Well, he said, you take a social drink. No, sir. He said, do you want, to, want me to put down here that you're a teetotaler? <laughs> and I said, well, I, I don't drink. That's a teetotaler. <laughs> I could just tell what was happening. There was an open window there, and this job was going right out that window. I just wasn't giving the kind of answers that was impressing him at all, and he just kept writing these things down. He finally put the pencil down, and he said, Do you know anything about FBI work? And I said, Well, a little. He said, you, uh, you are going to continue your law school? Yes, sir. You're going to apply as the position, uh, for the position as an agent when you graduate, I presume? Yes, sir. Well, do you know what agents do? Well, uh, a little. Well, he says, let me tell you what they do. They go out and look for fugitives, bank robbers gangsters, kidnappers, gunmen, and cutthroats. He says, you know, we don't find them in Sunday school classes. <laughs> I said, no, sir. He said, you know, an agent has to go into a tavern or a bar, a juke joint, and maybe stay there all day waiting for one of these people to come in in case this is one of the place where he, places where he hangs out. And you're not supposed to attract any attention. How do you think a teetotaler would get along in a situation like that? <laughs> and I didn't know. All I knew was I wasn't going to get this job. And I remember how depressed I felt. I really did want a chance to be in the FBI. Finally, he folded up this yellow pad, and I knew he was probably going to throw it in the waste paper as soon as I had left. And he took me to the door, and he reached out and shook hands, and then he said, Did you enjoy missionary work? It was sort of like pouring salt into a wound. And so I think I was a little aggressive as I turned and said, Yes, I did. Very much. And he said, Well, I enjoyed my mission to Denmark. That was the first time I knew I was talking to a member of my own faith. <laughs> and after I received my appointment, I discovered that if I had answered any of those questions any differently than I did, I probably would not have been appointed. And in later years, when I had the privilege of working right under Mr. Hoover, I heard him say on many an occasion, that he had learned a long time ago that a boy who will let down his church and his family would probably let down the FBI. And so the FBI had a set of questions for Mormon boys and a set of questions for Catholic boys and a set of questions for Baptist boys or any other denomination just to see whether or not they 
were men enough to subscribe to the things they had been taught from their youth. Well, after I went into the FBI, I found out what you do when you go into a bar or a tavern or a juke joint and wait for a fugitive. You do just what the other agents do. None of them were allowed to drink on duty. They could take a social drink off duty, but to become intoxicated was a basis for discharge, or to drink while on duty was a basis for discharge. And I found that each of the agents had his own little way of working it out and not attracting attention. And I found very early that I was able to go up to a bar, wait until no one was close around, act very much at home, which of course I wasn't. And then when I had a chance, I'd call the bartender down and I would say, Joe, I want a seven up straight. <laughs> And he'd wink at me as though to say, well, at least I've got one customer who knows when he's had enough. <laughs> and so he'd usually fix it up very nice, and there it was. And I found that in the FBI, I never at any time had to violate a single standard that this church prescribed. As a matter of fact, one of the great assets uh, of my work in the FBI was the fact that the training I was supposed to have come from was disciplined and strict. And Mr. Hoover said that when that was the case and young people held up, he had confidence in them too. I gained a great affection and appreciation for John Edgar Hoover, a man whose entire life has been dedicated to building a better America and I always counted it a great honor to have been associated with him in a small way. As we grow more mature in life, we learn that these things that the church prescribes for us, high standards of living, honesty, morality, that these things all make for happy living. Uh, sometimes I hear uh, People say, well, I don't know why the church is so strict. You don't have any fun. It turns out to be just the opposite. You not only have fun, but you can remember it the next morning. <laughs> and in the law enforcement profession, where in the days gone by, when I first entered the profession, uh, being able to drink rather heartily was supposed to be a token, a sign of being a man. And uh, right at the very beginning, I made it very clear that while I wasn't going to drink with them, I wanted to have just as good a time as any of them. And I can remember occasions in those days when sometimes somebody would come up and say, uh, Skousen, if you don't drink with me, you're no friend of mine. And you know, I wouldn't have to say a word. There'd be about five or six voices that would jump up immediately and say, Joe, this boy doesn't drink. And that was the end of the matter. I never had to apologize or explain. They all seemed to sort of take a vicarious pride in the fact that I wasn't going to drink. In fact, I had a chief of police tell me one time, if you ever take a drink, I'll sure be disappointed. Well, that's sort of the way it is. We don't miss anything. There are lots of things about the church that uh, set this pattern. I remember, for example, the teachings that I received from my own father concerning um, cussing. Now, I was raised on construction camps where the men around me uh, were uh, very articulate. <laughs> and uh, in those days, we didn't drive trucks. We drove mules. Great, big, honorary mules. And there are only two things that a mule can understand, and that's the end of a long line and Anglo-Saxon. <laughs> and these mule skinners had their own special vocabulary, and I often wondered uh, how they could say so much without taking a breath. And that was the only time that the mule's ears would swing back to listen. The rest of the time you could just go along and, and talk to them like a horse and it just didn't make any difference at all. Well, on one occasion, 
I think I was about uh, 12, 13, right in there somewhere. We had a big ornery mule, about 16 hands high, weighed about 1,400 pounds. And I was alone in the corral, and I was late getting out with my four up, and, and um, I couldn't get a bridle on this mule. I got it over one ear, all right, but th he did this to me every time when I was alone. He'd then swing his head over just far enough away so I couldn't get the bridle over the other ear, and then the bridle, and then the bit in his mouth. And so I got a keg of nails, wheeled it over there, and uh, got up on top of that, and he knocked that over. And while I was hanging on his neck and just barely getting my feet on the ground, he reached over and stepped on my foot. <laughs> and he stayed there. And a 1,400-pound mule on that foot, and all the exasperation of the moment, pulled a trigger in my brain, and when I finally got loose, I went over and I did what was absolutely forbidden, uh, on our construction camps, my father said no one was to beat a mule with a tug. I went for a tug. And so I, I started talking to this mule. And uh, I, I would emphasize every other word with the tug. And so he, he moved. He was going around in circles, <laughs> and me right behind him. And uh, all of a sudden I realized I was not alone. I looked up and there was my father. And so I stopped walloping the mule and stood there for a minute and the dust sort of settled. <laughs> father said, uh, where'd you learn that kind of language? I said, oh, around. <laughs> said, do you ever hear me use that kind of language? I said, well, not exactly. <laughs> well, did you ever hear me cuss at any of the horses or mules? And I said, well, I heard you call one of the, the sorrel horse an old fool when he balked. Well, he said, what's this mule? And I said, well, he's an old fool, too. <laughs> All right, he says, now we're even. Now we're even. Don't you ever let me hear you calling these animals any name again, unless you hear me do it then you can. But I never heard him do it. <laughs> he was that kind of a father. It was the same way when he caught me smoking a cedar bark and newspaper behind the pig pen up in Canada. I think I was about nine. And I, I'd spent my only allowance, which was a nickel, to buy sen, sen to cover up my breath. And when he caught me, I, he looked down at the ground and there were about, um, oh, a half a dozen false tries down there. <laughs> he said, did you like it? And I said, nope. <laughs> Burned my tongue. Really was awful. He said, are you going to do it again? I said, nope. Well, he said, it doesn't make a man out of you. It makes you think that you're a man at the moment, but it really doesn't. You can smoke as soon as I start smoking. Is that a bargain? Yep. And of course, I knew that would be never. And there was a, that night or the night following, I've forgotten which, that he sat me down and told me a story. And I was so impressed with it that I included it in the Explorer Manual that I was asked to write for the scouting program in 1948 and 1949. My father had been probably the first white man to take a caravan from the Gulf of Mexico across the Sierra Madre Mountains, or the Rocky Mountains rather, into Durango in the center of Mexico. He had five Mexicans and a younger 16-year-old brother to help him. And um, they were given up for dead. It was thought they'd been killed by the Yaqui Indians. They were lost up in those mountains. All of their horses got rot hoof after the horseshoes had given out. And uh, I think they were able to get through with a few little Spanish mules, but all their horses died en route or got rot hoof and had to be shot. 
And it wasn't until the rainy season had started in the late fall that they finally were able to work their way down um, and arrive in the valleys over in the state of Durango. And it was there that a rescue party found them, and it, uh, it included a great big hearty fellow named George Orr. And I'm quoting here my father's own story as he later recorded it. George Orr was wild and rough, as wild and rough as they come. Not content to smoke, chew tobacco, and drink whiskey himself, he had tried many times while we were building the railroad on the Yaki River to get me to smoke, chew, or drink with him. Or he would pick out a little Mexican girl from my companion saying, Now you've got to do these things. Show people you're a man. Now don't be a sissy. But he had no luck. As we were traveling toward the city of Durango, after the rescue party picked us up, he remarked to one of the boys that he would make me chew tobacco before we arrived in Durango. The next day as we stopped for lunch, I unsaddled my horse, took off my belt and six shooters, spurs and shaps. Watching his chance, George slipped up behind me, threw both arms around me, and down I went, with him a straddle of me. Out came his last plug of chewing tobacco, as he said. Now, you little devil, you're going to take a chew. I'll make a man out of you yet. I was in a tight spot. I said, well, George, it looks like you're going to win at last. And I'm going to have to chew some of that dirty stuff that even a hog wouldn't eat. But let me up so I can take a good big bite. You know, that tobacco juice would choke me to death down here. So he let me up, saying, now, no monkey business, Roy, and handed me the tobacco. I got ready to take a big bite with my mouth wide open. Just then I motioned quickly towards some of the men and said, Hey, Jones got kicked by a mule. George turned to look and I was gone like a flash. My father incidentally later equaled the, um, the world uh, record for the 50-yard dash in Canada, and I think this is where he learned how to do it. <laughs> George started after me shouting, Stop, stop, I'll kill you. He fired at me several times, but I made it to a small canyon nearby and threw his last plug of tobacco just as far as I could throw it. George had lost sight of me, so I turned to camp before he did and picked up my two six-shooters. As George came back into camp cursing and swearing at me, I fired a shot just to the right of his feet. Now don't do that, he said. I was just fooling. I fired on the other side of his feet and said, George, start dancing. I'll teach you to be a man. George began hopping and dancing and swearing and pleading as I peppered the ground with shots. Finally, when he was all out of breath, I stopped. He was more respectful after that. But he suffered a lot before we got him another plug of tobacco. I would ride alongside of him now and then and say, Well, George, how are you feeling? His only answer was, Shut up. <laughs> well, it was a great day when we finally came into headquarters just south of the city of Durango. All hope of our being alive had long since been abandoned as everyone thought we had been killed by the Yaki Indians. It was a marvelous feeling to know we were safe at last. So with that kind of a father, and I know he's typical of the fathers that you have had too, and with that kind of an example, even though in our family our boys were raised in rough camp life, as far as I know, all of them came through morally confident and obedient to the standards of the church. So I close with this thought. You young people are a most fortunate generation. You're living in a day when there never was such great opportunity to learn and to do. And those of us who are just a little further up the trail than you are have only one desire in the affection of our hearts for you, and that is that you do succeed. And I pray God that he may bless each of you who in your youth we hope will find the pattern for happy living, and that he will bless each of us who are a little older and who are asked to be teachers and guides, bishops, stake presidents, high counselors, scout workers, that we will be loyal to our trust, that this may be the lot of both of us in this wonderful day in which we live. I humbly pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.